It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Call me Ishmael. We the people. Sunny days sweeping the clouds away. All brilliant one-liners, right? Opening lines that you can't forget. They grab you, they pull you in, and somehow they elicit more questions and at the same time bring a whole summary to the story that you're about to experience. One could just reflect on these opening lines and have a heart message to consider. After Jesus went to the top of the hill where his disciples followed, he opened his message with a thesis <coughs> that captured all the, that would unfold in the rest of his sermon, his life of actions, words with others, daily experiences all the way till death and then beyond. If the disciples had known that this sermon and these opening lines of the Beatitudes were his thesis, maybe they would have listened harder or noticed more. But how can we know? How can we know when a line or a simple phrase or gesture will change the course of our life? The disciples heard this message and lived it with Jesus, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit fully understood it, in order to share it with others. That's a lot of time to meditate and muse over these key phrases. But as we'll discover in the next four weeks, knowing and embodying Jesus' message is the work of a lifetime. I pray that the next couple weeks we'll at least taste, shift with, and hold tight to Jesus' opening lines in a new way. I provided some sermon notes for you in your bulletin and offer you places for reflection. Some, for some of you, that's the way you learn. For some of you, closing your eyes and listening is a great gift. And some of you will just take this home and then a couple of days later come back and be like, oh yeah. May it be a gift to you because no doubt there will be lots to take in. <laughs> And as we've mentioned, one line is enough, right? So still, allow this time to be a moment of rich engagement and a space of learning and growing. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, O oh God. And in the midst of these opening lines, may we open our hearts to you and to what you have for us to hear this day. Amen. Amen. I'm indebted to three specific resources for the Beatitudes this time around. About a year ago, I was reading a devotion from Brian McLaren's book, We, uh, we Build a Road While Make Walking, about the Sermon on the Mount. And now, I had encountered the Beatitudes in its many translations before, but I had never considered the full shift that these words in context would take as Brian McLaren oriented the Beatitudes. Through his reading and uh, my own further reflection, there's a blessing in this reorientation, and it took hold in my heart. It's from this grounded place that I'm both excited and scared to consider the Beatitudes for the next four weeks. If, when, we really encounter and embrace and allow Jesus' sermon to take hold, we can't stay the same or continue in a direction that doesn't really include these guideposts. Blessed be the people. That's a beautiful beginning, right? Inviting, welcoming, caring. However, this phrase was more like an Uncle Sam poster pointing at you, as if Jesus was saying, blessed are those and said, pay attention, pay attention. These are the people you should aspire to be like. This is the group you want to belong to. The grief stricken, the meek and humble, the persecuted. Yes, blessed be them, and you will be blessed too. Like most texts, and sweet pieces of literature, we can only fully appreciate the lesson, that deep message, if we can find ourselves in the place and time, if we can position our
ourselves in the space with the attitudes and customs and inherent richness and complexities that exist there. <coughs> Such is true about Jesus and first century Palestine. Jesus was a Jewish man, poor and hardly considered elite enough to reside in the circles of high Jewish priests or wealthy rulers. He came from and lived in the class of people who experienced over and over the squeezing, even debilitating oppression of the Roman Empire. He spoke the vernacular and language of the people, Aramaic, while also being trained as any young boy, Jewish boy would be in Hebrew, the temple language at the time. We hear a phrase in the Gospels, what good could come from Nazareth? That was another way of saying, what a country bumpkin. <laughs> and yet, and yet, following his baptism by his cousin John and a grounding experience in the desert, Jesus took on the role of a rabbi. Now, as I explained to the kids, a rabbi was a teacher, <clears throat> someone who shared facts and lessons, but also really tried to instill a way of life, a way of life for disciples who were both students and followers. This message became as much of an identity as it did a curriculum. Jesus' way included the wisdom of his Jewish tradition, specifically and particularly from the prophets, as well as nonviolent livelihood in its fullest understanding. His two particular languages, Aramaic and nonviolence, are essential in fully appreciating, much less being transformed by the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm grateful for John Deere. He unpacks this active, non-violent significance in this book, The Beatitudes of Peace. And then, Neil Douglas quotes, unearth the breadth of Aramaic through his translation and commentary. These are both rich resources, and in four weeks you can borrow them. <laughs> Let me dive into Aramaic a little bit. Anyone speak Aramaic? Anyone speak uh, Arabic? A Middle Eastern language? Okay, great. Well, the Aramaic language is a topic that's so expansive, I will kind of dive into unpack a little bit of it each week. But I wanted to start here. According to some scholars, Aramaic was a derivative of ancient Hebrew. Others say that Aramaic itself is older and based more on ancient Middle Eastern roots. Although Greek was introduced into the Middle East after the conquest of Alexander the Great, it never became the language of the native peoples. Aramaic served as the lingua franca until it was replaced by a derivative tongue, Arabic, during the rise of Islam. Even so, Aramaic continued to be spoken widely in the Middle East into the 19th century and is still used in parts of Syria, as well as the entire church of the East. The basic characteristic of this language is its multiple entry points. It's much like a diamond or a crystal where you see its various cuts, and if you look at it from each of those angles, you see a different beauty, a different uh, expression, depending on the light. With Neil's translation from Aramaic, we'll consider three different entry points. The intellectual, the metaphorical, and the universal or mystical. The intellectual is what we might consider the literal Translation. Yet even that doesn't go far enough because all of these translations could be considered literal. The metaphorical vantage point speaks to the metaphor for life in the community and asks the question, where are the rigid places in my life and in society? How are we prevented from receiving sustenance when we deny the natural abundance of creation and God? Finally, there's the universal or mystical. This entry point asks the questions, what does this have to do with me and the cosmos and God? What feelings do these words evoke? What opens within me? Considering all of this, it's a collection of wealth 
unto itself. And so we'll dive in, hopefully a little bit more deeply than the sparse iconic. Can you put me to What we say to cats. Well, Fluffy, you bought the furniture for the last time. I'll tolerate none of that behavior. And what they hear, an empty bubble. <laughs> <laughs> what we say to dogs. Okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, stay out of the garbage. Or else, what they hear, blah, blah, Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this is richer than that. <laughs> Bless it. Are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me offer you a Aramaic translation. Happy and aligned with the one are those who find their home in the breathing. To them belong the inner kingdom and queendom of heaven. Blessed are those who are refined in breath. They shall find their ruling principles and ideas, ideals guided by God's light. Tuned to the source are those who live by breathing unity. Their I can is included in God's. Healthy are those who devotedly hold fast to the spirit of life. Holding them is the cosmic ruler of all that shines and rises. Resisting corruption, possessing integrity, are those whose breath forms a luminous sphere. They hear the universal word and feel the earth's power to accomplish it through their own hands. Healed are those who devote themselves to the link of spirit. The design of the universe is rendered through their form. Sometimes the Beatitudes can feel like they're putting us in, in our place. Certainly it does to me. Sarah, feel free to get off that high horse, you know? Stop, um, move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reorient yourself from just that comfortable place of ease. And so this opening beatitude reminds me that real strength and might comes from vulnerability. Vulnerability is a rich reality to live because it's a shift in power. Perhaps we've heard this word before as it connotates weakness or being a sissy. Instead, vulnerability is strength through authenticity, awareness of gifts and limitations, and a recognition of where I begin and end, and how God is in it all. The Aramaic word meskanai offers a multiple images of a solid home, resting point, a holding fast to something. Ruka means breath, soul, whatever stirs, moves, animates, and links us to life. Together, Jesus is saying, the poor in spirit are those who have a resting point from which they are animated. There is a connection to the source of holy breath in which life stirs in us. But this is not a gloating acquisition. It's a humble recognition that one doesn't need to prove anything or put oneself forward inappropriately. In my vulnerability is strength, found in God, and not left to shrivel, but be empowered for what brings life. Action forms out of God's prompting, that resting point of light. And such enlightening light is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom includes the image of a fruitful arm poised to create. There's also a compelling desire or willingness to say, yes, I can. I can step into that direction. I can walk in that way of God. I can embrace that rhythm of breath and life. With these attributes and orientations, the call of solidarity, being with others in the midst of strife, persecution, suffering, or oppression, is less about a good deed and instead a natural movement toward God. When you finish a long run, or mowing the lawn on a hot day, or cleaning around the house, 
you're drawn to a glass of water. Being drawn to others, and even imitating others out of this natural way of breathing and resting in God's essence, is just like how you're drawn to water when you're thirsty. That is what it means to be poor in spirit, an inheritor of the kingdom. Gandhi offers a quote to help us understand what it is to live in solidarity with the poor. Recall the face of the poorest and weakest person whom you have seen, and ask yourself if the next step you contemplate is going to be of any use to that person. Will that person gain anything by it? Will it restore that person to control over his or her own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to freedom for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Then you will find your doubts and yourself melting away. No doubt we've all experienced wounds, disconnections from the animating source of life. Perhaps we've sought uh, guidance and nourishment from other sources, from pride or ego, arrogance or judgment, even control. Control by way of money or misuse of power, such as position or systems that prop us up. When Jesus calls us to pay attention, blessed are these, we take on a yoke and fall into being and taking on a new identity by way of our breath. We must renew our spirit, our breath, our soul by connecting it back to the source and enter that home base and resting point. And that gives us both strength, even when we feel vulnerable, and open eyes to see brothers and sisters. So for a moment, I want us to practice this, live into this yearning and experience of breathing. So take a moment and just settle yourself in this space. Be aware of the surroundings and experiment with breathing in and out. You can work, use the words ruka, meaning spirit and soul. You can use the words abba, father. And as you breathe in, you say the word, and as you breathe out, you say the word. Let the rhythm of that word and the rhythm of the breath merge in a way that feels natural. And now find your breath going through your whole body. Feel that breath fill up your lungs. Give animation to your arms and fingers. Give life to your legs all the way to your toes. Give you a resting spot for your heart and your head. Allow your breathing to cradle and rock whatever part of you has been ignored or starved from its connection to the source of life. Spirit 